I'm going to start the certification course with a brief overview of some of the best behaviors of the most successful board members that we work with over the years. And uh, our hope is that by sharing these habits with you, it'll make you a, uh, a better board member in your community. So I'm going to start off with a funny little video here. Some of you may have seen, but I think it does portray how some people out there maybe perceive their, uh, their HOA boards. Oh, we love our new home. Neighborhood's great. Amazing school district. The HOA has been very involved. These shrubs aren't board approved. You need to break down your cardboard. Thank you. Violation. Violation. I see you've met Cynthia. At least Geico makes bundling our home and car insurance easy. And does help us save a bunch of money. Two inches over regulation. Thanks, Cynthia. So I think, uh, like we said, some people maybe have a negative opinion of, uh, of board members, but it, it does not have to be that way. In our experience, uh, board members who, uh, who take a strong leadership role and are fair and uh, transparent and, and really run their communities the right way are well received. And uh, you can actually have a very positive impact on, com on your community, and they are very well respected in their communities when they do things the right way. So I think first we're going to talk a little about some of the, the worst practices that we've seen, and sometimes these are called condo commandos. I guess in our case, they'd be HOA commandos. But what are the, some of the things we really shouldn't be doing? Uh, first, you know, let's not make decisions based on a personal agenda. Just because you don't swim doesn't mean we shouldn't replace the pool furniture. Uh, don't exclude opposing board members. Uh, if <clears throat> you, you have to involve everyone in the decision-making process. Uh, penny wise and pound foolish decisions. If, if your claim to fame as a board member is that the dues haven't gone up in 10 or 15 years in your community, uh, you really need to ask yourself, are, are we doing the right thing or uh, is, is the community really going downhill here rapidly? Are you micromanaging staff and vendors? Do you have board, are you a board member who can't get out of the office or needs to read every email? Uh, keeping everyone in the dark, you know, transparency is a reason why a lot of you probably ran for the board. Remember that now that you're on the board. Uh, ignoring the rules. There are a lot of rules that govern HOAs. Uh, Bill and Sue will go into a lot of detail about which ones are most important to you, uh, but I can assure you that you cannot ignore them. And if you do, it can be trouble. And the last one is attacking your neighbors. Uh, you know, you, it's, you need to listen to your, to your residents and uh, try not to criticize and con uh, condemn those who may disagree with you. So let's talk about what are the seven habits of the most successful board members. They put their community interests first, they seek consensus, they invest in their communities, they trust their managers, they over communicate, they play by the rules, and they, at the end of the day, they try to be a good neighbor. So let's get into these in a little bit more detail, P putting your community interests first. So <laughs> the board has a fiduciary responsibility to look out for the best interests of the community. Uh, this, this will differ greatly by community, but regardless, remember you do have this duty to maintain the property values. Uh, keeping up the physical property and changing with the times to try to make sure your community is going to appeal to new buyers. So even something that might not be of great value to you personally may have a lot of benefit to the community and a lot of benefit to those who are considering buying in your community. What are some of those examples that we see right now? Converting tennis, to, tennis courts to pickleball courts. Uh, you may not play either sport, but again, that can encourage new owners. Uh, adding charging stations for electric vehicles. It only benefits a small number of people today, but it's a forward thinking thing that uh, you know, people, younger uh, you know, buyers are looking for. And upgrading your entrances and your monuments. Uh, this is just purely aesthetic. And I think a lot of people overlook that because they're just made out of concrete and they don't typically go bad necessarily. But that your entranceway can have a huge impact on your property values. It's the only part of your community if you're gated that many people will ever see if they don't ever come inside your community and the way that that entranceway looks and feels can really uh, date and your community and have an impact on property values these are just a few examples i'm sure you can come up with a ton more for your community but uh, you know, make sure you're putting the community interest first not just your own the second habit is seeking consensus so the best board members are experts at rallying support and knowing how a vote is going to go prior to a board meeting 
Now, how do they do this? First off, you cannot meet in a quorum of the board to do this. And Bill and Sue will go into what that means. But as long as you're getting together with other board members with less than a quorum, which means if it's a seven member board, three or less, a five member board would be two and a nine member board would be four or less. Uh, you cannot have a majority of the board getting together. But if you but you can get together in smaller groups. And when you do that, these board members have a professional working relationship with the other board members and that they recognize that although they may have some philosophical differences, they still need to work with the others that disagree with them and they treat them with respect and they do listen to their concerns. These great board members discuss these big issues offline, like I said, with one of the two other board members at a time to hear out their ideas and their concerns prior to a public board meeting. Remember, criticize in private, praise in public. Uh, some of your fellow board members, you know, when put on the spot in a, in a crowded meeting hall or a, a Zoom with 100 or 200 or 500 people on it are going to react very differently to an idea than they might in private where you could, you know, convince them that maybe their position or decision isn't necessarily the best one for the community. But if you put them on the spot in public, they will fight you know, to the death to try to be right. So keep that in mind. Um, try to, you know, these board members are gonna try to address these concerns and incorporate these ideas as part of the process leading up to the decision before a final vote gets taken. So that might mean going back to bidders to make a change to the scope of work. If you're proposing rules, it might mean modifying these rules before they ultimately get voted on. You should at least board members should at least know their concerns have been heard and if possible addressed before a final vote. And these great board members are able to compromise. You're ultimately working with a group of five, seven, nine, or more board members. So the best board members accept compromises are going to need to be made to get things done for the overall benefit of the community. So try not to let perfection be the enemy of the good. So if, if a, a good solution that can get passed through your board is better than what you determined to be a perfect solution that may not ever make it. <clears throat> and the ultimate test as a board member is you're going to get outvoted at some point. You're going to be on the wrong side of a set of a five to two vote or a three to four vote. How do you handle that? Ultimately, once the board makes a decision that it, that should be the will of the community and the, and the whole board should work to try to make sure that whatever it is that got voted on happens. If you, know, you do not want to, sit on the sidelines and, and try to be difficult because you didn't vote for something that you want to see it fail. That's not going to be in the best interest of your community. And it's probably going to cost you more money in the long run. So that brings us to investing in your community. So remember we talked about the board has a duty to try to maintain the property values of the community. So that means investing in the common areas and potentially even making capital improvements, which would mean adding things to the community that may not even be there today. Uh, and keep in mind, you know, you do have a lot of you in HOAs are going to have reserve funds, even though it's not required by statute necessarily. And again, the Bill and Sue will get into that in more detail. But hoarding cash may not look good. Uh, it may look good on your balance sheet, but it's not going to be helping your community. Those reserve funds are off. They're saved to be spent. And you need to make sure that you're investing back in your community, not just socking away cash. So what do you do? You get a professional reserve study. That's gonna look at all of the components of your community, determine how much they cost to replace and about how much, law, how much life they have left on them. You can then use that as a guide to formulate a three to five year plan for your community so that you're constantly investing back into the community and fixing the thing, the major capital items that are gonna need replacement. That might be roads, that might be the roof on your clubhouse, might be the interiors of your clubhouse, but all of those things you should be considering how long are they going to last and how are we going to pay for them as they start to fail or, or become uh, just too dated? Uh, you know, I firmly believe maintenance should really go up a little bit each year. There might be extenuating circumstances. There might be a year we get to renegotiate a huge cable contract or something and, and maybe the dues stay flat or even go down a little. But that should really be the exception and never the norm. Think about your own home. The cost of maintaining and insuring your home goes up every year and the, and the cost to maintain and insure your common areas is no different. Keeping the maintenance the same every year should not be the goal of the board. You have to think of your community like an investor would. You're not just representing your own home anymore. When you're on the board, you're representing all the homes in the community. So if you have 100 homes in your community and a $300,000 average value, that's $30 million in real estate that you as a board are trying to maintain. And you have a fiduciary responsibility to try to maintain that $30 million asset. Wouldn't you spend 50,000, 100,000, or even a million dollars to maintain your $30 million asset if you thought it might decline by say 5% in value? 
Five uh, percent of thirty million is is one point five million. That's how you have to think as a board member now. You you have all of these assets that you're responsible for. So what a hundred thousand sounds like a lot of money to an individual homeowner, but it is not a lot of money when you're looking at your community as a whole. The next thing is trusting your manager, and I'm going to expand that onto even trusting your, your other outside professionals. Uh, if you can't trust your manager, you probably have the wrong property manager. Property managers are licensed professionals, typically with years of experience in their field. It's important to let them do their jobs. The board does have ultimate decision-making authority, but try to avoid getting involved in the day-to-day -day details of operating your association. Do you have board members sitting in the office for hours at a time uh, telling the manager what to do? Do you have board members that are reading every email? If the answer is yes, ask yourself, where does the problem lie? If that manager can't be trusted, you probably should look for a new manager or a new management company. If that manager is competent, give them some breathing room to do their job. They'll get a lot more done and be a lot more efficient and less likely to burn out. But the flips, there's a flip side of this, and that is don't assume managers are experts in every field of property management. Uh, respect a property manager who wants to bring outside professionals on a large project. Maybe the, you need to redo your roads, you need a paving engineer, you want to redo your roofs, you should consider a roof consultant or engineer. If you have a contract, you should bring in your attorney to review your contracts. Uh, these costs are very minimal relative to the, to the entire project cost uh, and, and preparing well up front and having the right contracts in place can prevent huge five, six, and even seven figure mistakes down the road. So respect when your manager says that they're not an expert in every field and that they're going to need help on a big project. It is worth everyone's while to make sure that those huge projects and expenditures are handled properly. The next habit is over communicating. So one of the top complaints we hear from new board members is that there was a lack of transparency and that's why they ran for the board. Uh, they alleged decisions were made in secret, that they don't know how their money's being spent, et cetera. So a mistake that some new board members try to make to improve transparency is trying to transform the board meeting minutes into a transcript and record the full discussion for all the owners. Uh, unfortunately, that is a bad idea. Uh, that All that does is create a huge liability for the association potentially if something goes wrong. And plaintiff's attorneys, all they want to do as soon as they file a lawsuit against your association is ask for a copy of all your meeting minutes to see what you've been talking about and what how they could possibly use that against you. Board meeting minutes are supposed to be a summary of the actions taken by the board, not all the discussion and not all the debate. So <clears throat> we, we'll talk about that in a second. There, we do have an article that can help you with that. But if you're not gonna communicate via the minutes, how are you going to communicate? Uh, we strongly believe the board and management should be sending a monthly, uh, a monthly newsletter. It may contain a manager's report. It may contain some input from the board. Uh, community email blasts about important events and happenings in your community. Maybe it's the landscape schedule, the pest control, control schedule. Maybe there's a uh, tropical storm or hurricane. Uh, these are all things we should constantly be communicating by email and staying out in front of the rumor mill. I see some boards put together an annual State of the Union address, which is a letter or email summarizing the accomplishments of the board and management for the last uh, you know, year and all the progress that they've made. That can go a long way to helping everyone understand what you've been doing because a lot of people don't know. And the last one is town hall meetings. Uh, we used to do these in person. Now we do them on Zoom. But uh, when you have a large or complex project that's going to affect a lot of the residents in your community, uh, you know, bring in your professionals, bring in the management company, bring in the engineer, bring in the, the, the paving contractor, if we're doing a paving project, and let them answer the hard questions for you. Most of the time, they'll do this for free, for very limited cost, and let them explain to your residents why you need to spend a million or $2 million on your roads and what happens if it doesn't. You don't have to be the expert in these areas. You don't have to answer every question. So leverage your professionals, let them help you uh, look educated and intelligent when you're performing a big project. So I talked about minutes a little bit before. Uh, we have a blog at www.readfan.org. Uh, if you go to readfan.org, there is a search box and you can type in meeting minutes and you can it'll bring you to a blog post that tells you how meeting minutes should be taking and taken and what should be in there. And again, that's www.readfan.org. So what is the next habit of our successful board members? It's playing by the rules. 
rules were not made to be broken in an HOA. In fact, most of you bought in an HOA because you wanted some rules, more so than maybe your local city or municipality. So the, the, that means you have covenants, you have a declaration, and the board has a duty to enforce those covenants. In fact, the association can even be sued to compel the board to enforce its covenants. So it's important to lead by example, not be accused of selective enforcement, and follow the same rules as everyone else. We recommend developing a routine, consistent inspection program and delegate inspections to management. Try to remove yourselves as board members from being the ones to cite violations. There have been many significant judgments against community associations that haven't followed their rules or tried to enforce their rules in an improper way. You do not want to be a board member who ends up uh, you know, on the board when they incur fifty or $100,000 in legal fees for both the association and you may have to pay the owner's legal fees in some cases. So be very careful as to how you're applying these rules and, and when you get involved in litigation. Uh, no, another example of rules that are meant to be followed, there's going to be a lot of state and federal laws that you need to follow as a board member. Again, Bill and Sue will cover the most important ones. But if there's one I could talk to you about, it's the HUD laws. If you have a background check process in your community and you think you want to deny a tenant or purchaser, please, please, please involve your legal counsel before you make that decision. Uh, that you could end up very quickly in a federal lawsuit and what you might think is common sense related to uh, background checks, felonies, credit scores, et cetera, uh, is not common sense. And uh, it's a very uh, quickly evolving area of the law. So if you have any interest in denying someone to live in your community, please consult counsel before you make that decision. And the last habit is being a good neighbor, as Mr. Rogers would say. You are a board member, but you are still everyone's neighbor. Uh, it's easy to develop an us versus them attitude when you sit on the board, especially if you have a group of owners constantly picking at your every move. But remember, you all live in the same community and benefits the community is good for everyone. And you may not be on the board in a year or two years or five years. And at that point, you're still going to be living in the community. You do not want to be at odds with your neighbors. You want to constantly be trying to represent your neighbors as best you can. Remember, sometimes a simple phone call or sharing a cup of coffee with someone can resolve an issue much better or faster than a nasty email reply, a text message, or a letter from management or the attorney. Not always. Sometimes you have to do that. But really try to engage your neighbor first if you can. Treat your neighbors the way you want to be treated and try to de-escalate situations whenever possible. Uh, stay off Facebook and next door, or at least don't contribute on those forums. Uh, they can be very toxic and you cannot let a small minority of the people on social media drive down, drive the agenda for the whole board and or drag down your mental health. So be very careful how you use those social media platforms. Um, remember, you're never going to please all of the people all the time as a board member, so you cannot get too hung up on the negative comments. Uh, focus on the good of the community and the silent majority. Uh, to try to help with some of these things, you may want to try to have a code of conduct or a code of ethics. Again, that's something we provide on our blog at www.readfan.org. You can search for code of conduct and you will find a blog post that, uh, that has examples from CAI, which is the Community Association Institute, uh, who puts together a lot of collateral for uh, community associations. So <clears throat> just to recap again, what were the seven habits of our most highly successful board members? They're constantly putting the community interest first. They seek consensus among their other board members and, and try to do so in a way that's not embarrassing uh, to them. They try to invest in their communities and plan out further than just the next budget year. They trust their manager. They trust their other professionals in the industry. They over communicate whenever possible. They play by the rules and know when to involve counsel. And they try to be a good neighbor at all times. <clears throat>